Welcome, my name is Jeffrey Taylor. I'm the uh, director of uh, the Centre for Excellence for Particle Physics, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Elizabeth de Barberio. Elizabeth came to us, joined us in 2004 after already a, a very hectic career following her PhD at uh, Siegen in Germany in 1983. Um, she, since uh, coming to Melbourne, has been the powerhouse of uh, physics analysis for experiments at uh, KK in Japan looking at the difference between matter and antimatter, and uh, then ATLAS, the, one of the, the experiments that discovered the Higgs boson uh, in 2012, where she has been um, leading Australian anal analyses with great aplomb. She is um, known as a powerhouse in physics analysis and has had a, a string of uh, successful research students over the years since she's been here. And um, she's uh, been uh, part of the publication of the physics uh, particle physics bible, the PDG, the particle physics groups, uh, particle physics data book. She's uh, had many, many uh, international uh, invitations to international, international talks. She, um, and more recently, uh, was in 2013, I think, the um, Australian Institute of Physics uh, woman in physics um, lecturer for the year. And uh, so she's given many public talks as well as uh, being a, an international star in physics. More recently, she's turned her attention to um, the problem of dark matter, which you're going to hear about today, tonight. And uh, back a couple of years ago now, with uh, an eminent cosmologist, Jeremy Moll, they were looking around for a site, an underground site, for a dark matter experiment. And um, uh, they discovered the, uh, the Stall Mine, uh, which was uh, looking for uh, an additional use from just, uh, just collecting gold. Um, and since that time, this uh, the Stall project has blossomed into a really major international project uh, under the guidance of Elizabeth, who is the project director for it. And that's what we're going to hear about tonight. So, oh, I should say also that uh, she's a, a, an expert in Aboriginal art and uh, is, I think, one of Melbourne's uh, um, most uh, uh, important, from my point of view, I find it all the time, most important uh, restaurant critic. So, uh, so Elizabeth has uh, lots of things to her book. So tonight she's going to talk about the dark matter experiment. Thank you. Thanks. So tonight I'm going to discuss how do we try to understand what dark matter is. Can you hear my? It doesn't come out. Sorry, there are two microphones here and not clear. They are on. Which one? Which one I need to remove? This one or this one? I don't know which one. Sorry, too many microphones now. I don't know which is what. Put that one on. Oh, it's actually there. Next time, one microphone, please. Okay, I will keep all of them. And then this is the one. This is the one you need. Oh, sorry. Once we're recording this on um, YouTube. YouTube. So, um, okay. Over over. Thanks, so, can you hear me now? No. no. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so, too many microphones. I will do this anyway. I cannot use this hand except for that, so it's fine. Okay, so I'm going to discuss uh, today dark matter. How do we try to understand what is dark matter? But not from the astronomy point of view, astrophysical point of view, but from the particle point of view. And try to understand uh, how we really try to understand what is really at the fundamental level. So we know that dark matter exists because dark matter has a, a lot of effects on cosmos. Dark matter is important for our galaxy. Without dark matter, the galaxies 
or in, in particular in our galaxy, for example, will not exist. It's the things that keep together galaxy. And we know that dark matter exists because of the velocity of which the star go and rotate around the center of the galaxy. Then we know that dark matter is very important and we know again, and this is we know by, um, by general relativity, that is very important for the large, what we call the large structure of the universe, how galaxies are put together, galaxies form cluster of galaxies, and they have a particular pattern. And this pattern is, uh, we believe, and most probably with strong uh, evidence, depends on dark matter. Then we have also that uh, dark matter is, uh, can bend light. You know from general relativity that matter can bend space, and space that's fine? Oh. And space, and then when light travels to space, light can bend. And this is called gravitational lenses, exactly as you put a normal lens through light. And we know through this effect that dark matter exists in our universe, and also, but what we also know, for example, here there are two galaxies colliding, and you can see that here, this blue part is what we believe is dark matter, and the red part are the normal matter. And this one, if we look in the telescope, whichever kind of telescope we use, in the optic, in the infrared, we don't see anything that we call dark matter. But from the bending of light due to the matter there, we know that this dark matter is there. So dark matter has a profound influence on the universe as it is, on cosmology. And we know it exists, and there are very solid ground to believe that dark matter exists. However, we don't know what dark matter is. In fact, now, if we go from astronomy to particle physics, and we try to understand which kind of particle could be dark matter, and this is, is like the... the the zoo of fundamental particles that we particle physicists discover at Collider, we immediately realize that none of this particle could be the culprit for dark matter. We have here the photon, that is the light. Well, cannot be dark matter because dark matter by its nature and by its name does not emit light. That's why we don't see it. It cannot be this particle here called quarks because, well, these quarks make our ordinary matter, the matter we are made of. And if this would be the case, we would see dark matter, but we don't. <coughs> then we have other particles that they exist only in collider and not on Earth, but we can see maybe they exist in the cosmos and they make up dark matter. But then in the collider we realize that these particles disappear very quickly soon after they've been created, so they cannot be dark matter. Dark matter must be stable, must be there from the beginning of the universe. Is there with our galaxy, is there with the evolution of the universe, so cannot be also. And not there is a, a, a particle in the one that uh, we study as a particle physicist called neutrino, that has characteristics that you could think could be dark matter. However, one thing we know of dark matter is the speed that which moves around galaxy. And we know that it cannot be this particle called neutrino because the neutrino move too fast to be dark matter. So in the end, from just the observation from cosmology and astrophysics, we know that none of the non particle that fundamental particle that particle <coughs> physicists see in the collider could make up dark matter and also cannot be the normal matter. So what it is dark matter and why we uh, go around? Well, if we go again to uh, astronomy, we realize that what we call dark matter, dark matter account for 85% of the matter in the universe. So the matter of which we are made of, Earth is made of, is only 25%. The majority of the stuff that is in the universe, we don't know what it is, it is dark matter, which we have no candidate, no particle can be made of. And uh, the other side, so we know that it exists, as I say, I repeat, we know from gravity. Gravity tells us that there is dark matter. General, general relativity tells us that there is dark matter. Otherwise, uh, we'll not, some observation will be inexplicable. 
However, there is no observation of this dark matter that is not related to gravity. We have other fundamental forces in, na in nature, like electromagnetism, electricity, and so on, and we don't see dark matter with respect to these other forces. We only see dark matter with respect to general relativity. And so you are now asking yourself, is dark matter a real effect? Is really true that 85% of the matter in the universe, is this dark matter and I don't know, or general relativity is completely wrong, and so I see this effect as an effect of general relativity. We are pretty convinced that general relativity is correct, there are many um, signs is correct, and there are many signs that indeed this dark matter that we cannot see in any way, in, uh, because does not emit any kind of light, exists, and is 85% of the universe. But now we need to know what, what it is, how to look like. We particle physicists believe it's a new kind of, uh, of fundamental particle and we need to look for it. So what do we know about this fundamental particle? We, we know something because we know how interact with the other kind of particle we know and we know that has a mass. Now, if this particle make 85% of the mass in the universe, must have a mass, that's we know. Then it must be weakly interacting, that means that barely ever interact to the regular matter of which we are made of. And this is because otherwise we will be already seen or we will bump in dark matter all the time. So what do we know that between these two, so we know that we have has mass and is a weakly interacting. And so we think that dark matter with this property that uh, are weakly interacting and have mass are called weakly interactive massive particle or as I will see in this talk, they will be called WIMPs. <laughs> so here there is a representation of the WIMPs are three kids very happy to each other, interacting very little with each other. And this is what you will see. So when I will discuss about looking for dark matter in, in, uh, in direct detection, so looking really to see, to catch the particle of dark matter and, and say this is the particle that made 85% of the matter of the universe, I will always speak about these WIMPs. So, how can you catch dark matter? You can do different things. Dark matter is everywhere in the cosmos. Our galaxy is embedded in dark matter. In our galaxy, 85% of the mass of our galaxy is dark matter. What we see as a star, gas and, um, and planets is only 25%. So dark matter is everywhere. So what I can do? I can do three different things. One, what we call direct detection, and I'm going to explain what, it is, is the, what I'm going to concentrate here in this lecture. In this lecture, uh, we are on Earth, and I can put a detector on Earth, try to catch this dark matter and study what it is, exploiting the fact that when Earth goes around the Sun, that goes around the galaxy, is swimming in a sea of dark matter. And so, passing through this dark matter, I may design an apparatus that is able to see the dark matter, catch and study. The other way is what we call indirect. Why is indirect? Because in reality, I don't catch the dark matter particle. I just look in the sky and I see if there is any process, any kind of process or any kind of phenomena that I cannot explain with normal astrophysical phenomena due to normal matter. And so I can attribute to the so-called dark matter. It's very difficult. And because the cosmos is big and there are a lot of phenomena that we may not know about, it's not obvious that if we see something that we do not expect can be dark matter. And then there is the third way of producing dark matter, and this is in an accelerator, something like we particle physics like to do. We take particle, we, acc we accelerate with a, up to a very large energy, and then we collide and we produce new state of matter. And we are doing this at the LHC, and we hope that we have enough energy at the LHC to be able to produce this dark matter particle. Obviously, if we produce particle here that it could be dark matter particle, we will not be able to say, oh, oh I discovered dark matter. 
because it could be something different. There is no control if this is what we produce is really dark matter. So the only way that we say if we see dark matter, we nail it, is if we see dark matter with direct detection. That's why it's so important, and this is becoming the most important way of searching in dark, dark matter in the world. So we go back and look at us. Suppose we are in our galaxy, Earth goes around the galaxy and is embedded in this uh, dark matter. I can put a detector, an apparatus on Earth and hope that this wimp will hit the nucleus in my apparatus and I can see, measure, how much my nucleus has been moved by this dark matter particle. Exactly like on a billiard table I um, throw my ball that hit the other ball and I see how much they moved with respect to each other and so I know that there's been a collision. So this is a very simple way of looking for dark matter. Conceptually, it's very easy. I look, I have my particle dark matter hit my nucleus of the material of my detector, the, the nucleus move, I see how much my nucleus is moved, and I know that I'd catch dark matter. In principle, that. And uh, the, I exploit, as I said, that this, if this is our galaxy here, this kind of uh, halo, blue halo, is dark matter. So you can see that if this is our galaxy, we are surrounded by a sea, but a big halo of dark matter that is much larger than our galaxy and has a, la has a relatively large density. And so uh, our Earth, as it goes around the sun, that goes around the galaxy, swim in this wimp sea and our detector collide. And uh, this, mm, our, this particle wimp goes around the galaxy with a certain amount, with a certain quantity density and a certain speed. So there are quite a lot. Now, what is difficult in catching the dark matter? Conceptually, it's very simple, and I have a huge amount of dark matter particle in my galaxies, the majority. Well, it comes to the fact that there are wimps that interact very, very weakly. So now, suppose I have one dark matter particle and uh, suppose I want to see, catch, well, I want my dark matter particle being seen by my detector. And I made my detector of lead. Lead is a very dense material. And I want to know how many times my dark matter particle will interact, will have a collision with the nucleus of the lead. Well, to be sure that I have at least one collision, my lead block should be long at least one light here. It's among us. So how can I build a detector, so an apparatus on Earth that can see this dark matter if I need one light here of a lead block to see one dark matter particle, to have this collision? Well, what I do exploit is the following. The following that the majority of the dark ma the part, the matter in our galaxy is dark matter. So instead of one light here, my detector is a, a couple of meters of diameter, but I know that because of the majority of the mass in my galaxy, the matter in my galaxy are WIMPs, or dark matter, that I will have a million of these particles passing through my detector every year. Million and million. So what's happening that pro in the, the probability that my dark matter particle will uh, bump in one of the nucleus is, high, is larger because obviously interact very little, but you know, if you keep pushing, 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 it may happen. And so that's why I go and catch dark matter. Now, this is the conceptual part. We can see a little bit more, it's just like a billiard ball. So this is our dark matter that is a small ball that arrives on my nucleus, the big billiard ball is arriving, it pushes my nucleus away and then it disappears. The dark matter will interact weakly, it's always a weakly interact with my nucleus, it just pushes the nucleus away and then it disappears. So there is no hope that I can see the dark matter itself. But what I see, as I said before, how much my nucleus moves. 
or how much energy my mm, dark matter particle gives to my nucleus. And so, and if I have my apparatus and I see that the nucleus move, I know I catch it. But how can I see a nucleus moving in, a, in the material? It's not that I can go and look because it moves, you know, like at the micron level, at the sub-micron level, at the uh, sub-particle. So there is different way in nature that I can see that. When a nucleus moves in a material, it can do different things. It can bump in our nucleus and it can produce light. So my particle arrive, move my nucleus, my nucleus bump on other nucleus and this nucleus start producing light. It can produce other kind because the nucleus move a small current. I call it ionization or just like when you heat two particles, uh, two balls together, you can produce heat. When you have two cars that bump in each other, you can produce heat. So I can go and have a detector, an apparatus that see this tiny effect to see dark matter. Now this is, is there are a lot of industry. I'm not going here in detail of what we are going to do. There is a lot of industry to try to see how to build an apparatus to see dark matter. And I think here it's important to know that there are different ways I can see my nucleus, how it moves, and different instrument that I can use. And the different instrument that I can use that there is plenty around the world is that I don't know what is dark matter. So I need to use different instruments with different characteristics because maybe I'm not really designing something that is that can catch dark matter because I don't know what it is. So a variety of things are created. So this is what is the situation now. And all over the world we have that. But what is uh, it seems simple, say, okay, I have plenty of uh, apparatus around the world, we just look at nucleus recoil, but what is the problem? The problem is that the interaction is very rare. And then in matter, in the matter itself, what the constituent of the nucleus, that are the proton and the neutron, can also interact with the nucleus itself and can move the nucleus exactly as the dark matter will do. And then when I'm trying to do my experiment, because my dark matter interacts very, very subtly with my detector, with my apparatus, I'm swamped by this kind of events. Just to give you an idea, if I have 10 kilograms of material, say 10 kilograms of uh, glass, I will have uh, I can check and get less than one collision of dark matter with my nucleus a day. Then, how many of these collisions due to non-dark matter, due to the matter itself, or I will see later, cosmic ray I have per day, I have about 100 million of collision per day for the same amount of glass. So how can I found dark matter that has an interaction of less than one collision per day with respect to the rest of the collision due to normal process in the matter, in the normal matter. It's like look, looking for a needle in a high stack, but a high stack that is quite large. This is really true. So the only way we can go and catch dark matter is going in a very quiet place. But first we need to understand where this dark matter these uh, um, events that are not dark matter, that are so many, this collision comes from. The main source of collision comes from cosmic ray. There are a lot of particles that bombard Earth continuously that are produced by the sun, and then they arrive in the atmosphere, and you see all this name of this particle, are just particles that reach Earth, and they bombard us. In this moment, we are bombarded by a particle. And these kind of particles are many, many, many. So if I want to do an apparatus that want to catch dark matter, I cannot do an apparatus here on, Earth, on, on the surface of Earth because I will be swamped by all these particles that come from the sun and they can mimic the collision of dark matter. 
So normally it's happening that all the, all the detectors that try to look for dark matter, they are put on the mountains or in deep underground because they are when you go deep underground, this cosmic ray that comes from the sun, they do not reach. These are getting absorbed by the ground and so no, radio, uh, no, no cosmic ray reach your part. So normally what you do, you go around and you put a big hole underground. And you can see here the cosmic ray. This is the number of cosmic ray on the surface of Earth. And you can see here that the number of cosmic ray on the surface decrease as we are going down in, in depth. So, for example, this is calculated in what is like there would be water. You can see that deeper you go, this is as deep as you can go, the number of this cosmic ray of this radioactivity comes from the sun and from the rest of the cosmos decrease very, very, very much to almost disappear. For this reason, all the experiment around the world that look for dark matter are situated in underground lab. And these are the ground lab you can see here. This is all the underground lab at the moment in, uh, on Earth. And you can see that are quite deep. They go from one kilometer to almost two kilometers, over two kilometers depth. And they are put in there because without having a lot of overburden of ground over your head, this cosmic ray will swamp your experiment. And you can see here, for example, in a detail of a, uh, of a northern hemisphere experiment, um, underground lab, this is one of the newest one, is in America, here, in the, it's called Homestake in the US, and uh, you see it was an old mine, it's 1.5 kilometers deep, and you can see here how it looks like, here there is the ground, you go down 1.5 kilometers, and here, underground in South Dakota there is this underground lab and here there is one of the most the biggest um, apparatus to catch dark matter on earth. Now once you go underground it's not that now you are in a situation that you can still, you are in a quiet situation, you the cosmic ray disappears, so you can put now your apparatus there and hope that you can see dark matter. In reality, it's so rare the interaction of dark matter with the normal matter that even the normal radioactivity that you have in, uh, uh, in the rock, in the rock like in this room, is disturbing our apparatus. And in fact, because in the rock, in all the material that surrounds us, there are still a, a little bit of radioactivity that is left there. And this radioactivity can produce this particle neutron, then can interact with dark matter, with the, our matter, and mimic again dark matter. So even if we go underground, we need to design our apparatus in such a way that is protected that this radioactivity from the rock and we need to choose material that contains very little radioactivity, much, much less than, you know, than our body. Our body will be too radioactive for them. Just to give you an idea. A banana, no banana in this lab. Banana, too radioactive. We are too radioactive. So how do we choose this material? Well, there are different ways of choosing the material. One, for example, we can use what we call shielding, embed our detector in water. We can purify water to a high, high level. Or we can use, especially if you are in, in Italy, something that the ancient Roman did. And this is uh, uh, what they do is uh, Roman lead. Lead, in the Roman time, they were using lead as a baluster of, um, of ships. And they had a lot of uh, shipwreck around the Mediterranean because they had a lot of commerce around the Mediterranean and the Roman time. These lead baluster were produced uh, 2,000 years ago and then they've been uh, sitting down in the Mediterranean for 2,000 years. With the time, 
the small radioactivity that is contained in lead disappear because these elements that are radioactive disintegrated. So because this kind of material like this Roman lead, we call it, is ideal to shield our apparatus and put our apparatus in a very, what we call, radio-pure um, uh, environment. And in fact, many of these experiments, the apparatus that trying to catch dark matter is made of lead. And this is where we get it. In fact, I explain what's happening. Normally, this lead is taken, you can see here, if you want, I can also show the, um, the underground. This is, uh, is in the Mediterranean. The, um, they go and, and, and take up this lead then is recovered, then is brought in the underground lab where it is carved out inside, so you just left the shell outside. The uh, museum get the shell outside where there is the carving that tell where the lead was done and where it comes from, and the physicists keep all the lead inside the baluster. And this has been the, the, the part, and you can see here that exactly you see the baluster of lead. And it's been uh, 2,000 years under the Mediterranean, and if you do, if you realize this is a very, very low radioactive part. So this is a quite an interesting part of this kind of experiment. Now, apart this part that has to do with uh, low radioactivity, so you can see here now that are really trying to remove, and they are done, so when you do, they see where they're getting, they catalog, they give it to us, we remove the inside and we give the shell outside. There is, as I say, now, how there is the other way that is cheaper, if you are not Italian, the American use it, is using water. Water can be purified very, very much and absorb all this kind of radioactivity. This is one of the biggest experiments that exists, the most performant one at the moment, that is done uh, as a big tank of a noble gas called xenon, and then is embedded in this water. This is not Roman water, this is just uh, raining water that is purified, it's cheaper also. But this is the other two kind of technology. But you need to get a lot of space because here are people, and this is, you see how people go and dress in this kind of experiment because not because it's dirty, just because they are too radioactive and they need to clean, you know, like, it's the opposite of, is this kind of, of place, of lab, where we do this kind of experiment are the least radioactive place on Earth. It's really, radioactivity is almost zero in this kind of place. And so you can see this is the kind of experiment. And you can see that this is all the uranium, the kind of radioactivity that you do. What I want to point out of the radioactive elements that, uh, one, uh, that uh, are dangerous for these experiments are the potassium-40. Potassium-40, we have a lot of potassium-40, because potassium-40 is what we call a natural isotope that stay in, all over there is potassium, all over there is life. Bananas keep a lot of potassium, that's why bananas are dangerous. And I don't, it's not a joke that you are not allowed to bring bananas in the lab. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking, it's like, it's one of the mm, part. So this is the, I would say, the most powerful that exists experiment of this kind of type in which you put a big tank and you have a noble gas that interact very little with other stuff. And so you put in underground, you put in the water or in Roman lead, and then you wait for years and see if you can sketch dark matter. And this is a big industry. Have you seen how many laboratories there are around the world? Some of the laboratories have at least one or more dark matter apparatus. So what is the situation? The situation is a very interesting situation. Up to now, the dark matter results hunting, this is Jeremy Mould, nothing has been found of all these experiments. However, it's not really, really so dull the situation. There is one experiment that decide to change the technology and decide to catch dark matter in a slightly different way, and is the only one that does it. 
This experiment is the Dama Libra experiment. It's an experiment that is done in Italy in a national, uh, in an underground lab in a national park called the Gran Sasso National uh, Lab. And uh, is, uh, you can see here the experiment. You can see people that look like they are going on the moon or are they are surgeon. You know, this is the detector. And this part, this experiment, instead of having a big tank of noble gas, use, synth uh, use uh, crystal, sodium iodide crystal. Sodium is really salt, salt crystal. And it's a small, relatively small experiment in Gran Sasso. These gray things here is the Roman lead that I was saying. And inside you can see the crystal that you cannot see. The crystal are englobated in this, that in this kind of case of copper. Copper can be incredibly pure, pure. Copper can be very, very low radioactivity. Copper is one of the most pure um, elements that we can find around, apart from Roman lead. And this is, is in a very quiet clue. This experiment, what this experiment has of particular that is important? This experiment exploit the following. <coughs> here is the sun and here is Earth. Now, what's happening to our sun? Our sun travel around the center of the galaxy, rotate around the center of the galaxy with a velocity of 220 km per second. We're going quite fast. And uh, it's a lot, but uh, it's not much on the astronomical point of view because up to the beginning of the galaxy, the initial, oh, sorry, the beginning of the solar system, our sun uh, did, I think, 15, 20 times the turn of the galaxy. So it takes a long time. And then there is this, the, the Earth that goes around the sun. And uh, there is a certain velocity. You see that. First, we analyze what the Earth does. The depending where Earth is around the Sun, if it's in June or December, the velocity of the Earth with respect to the velocity of the Sun, the move around the, of the, uh, the galaxy, is opposite or it goes in the same direction. So you can think about you going on the bicycle and going faster or slower with respect to the velocity of the Sun, the move around the galaxy. Now, the Sun and all our solar system is embedded, if you remember, in this big, big, big sea of dark matter that you can assume still. So if you are in June or in December, you will notice that and you assume that the WIMP, the dark matter, is a kind of sort of air and you are on a bicycle, in June you will go faster so you will have more wind on you and in December, you will go slower, so you will, have, will feel less wind on you. And now, so you can think about if I put a detector, an apparatus to catch dark matter on Earth, it will happen that because I have more particle reaching Earth in June, when the velocity of Earth with respect to the center of the galaxy is larger, and in December I will have less particle because the velocity of Earth around the galaxy is slower. I can just compare how many particles I may see, how many uh, collisions I can see in June, and how many collisions in December. And if I look at the difference between the two and I see a difference in the number of collisions, I can see it's dark matter. Because I expect more collision in June, less collision in December just because of the position of Earth with respect to the Sun. So what do I expect to see? Well, I'm doing my experiment. I put my sodium iodide crystal, as I say, my salt crystal. And then I see that the number of counts that I see during the year changes. And I see that I count less particle of dark matter in December and more particle in dark matter in June. And so if I do this experiment and I see exactly this change, we call a modulation on number of particles that, I'm, uh, that I catch with my detector in June and in December, I can claim that I saw dark matter. Because the radioactivity, the, na the natural radioactivity of the rock, there is no motivation of changing with season, with uh, June and August. 
and December. So what's happening and what is experiment? This is my prediction. This experiment has been run now for 10 years. And these are the real data of the experiment. These experiments see exactly what we expect. That in December, they see more particle, more dark matter, and in, the, in uh, more collision. And in June, they see less collision, exactly with the same change that you expect that dark matter will provide. But this is, is really very puzzling because all the other experiments don't see anything. And this one that see in a different way, just not wait for the counting, but just see how many counting we have in the, in the winter, in the summer, sorry, in December and, and June, he sees that. And he sees for many, many, many years to the point that we call 9 sigma signal, this means it's really a discovery. And so this is a very important result, very controversial because no one else uh, could see, but in the world nobody else has been able to do this modulation, we call it measurement. This measurement has not been be able to reproduce because it's a very interesting, it's a very, very performant experiment, very, very low radioactivity. So why is it important, as I say, because this is, could be the first real dark matter signal ever. And if we can interpret it as a dark matter, it will be Yamongus. As I say, it's a very puzzling result, because if we interpret as dark matter, the characteristics of that dark matter are very peculiar, not the one we expect, compatible with what we expect from astrophysics, but very puzzling for the theorists they do not expect dark matter to behave in this way, so not be seen by the other experiment, but see that that. So there is a worldwide search to reproduce these results, but it's very difficult because testing the result requires three things. First of all, require that you go in the southern hemisphere. Why in the southern hemisphere? Because the fact that you count more in June and less in December or vice versa depends on the position of Earth with respect to the, uh, to the center of the galaxy. While if you are in the northern and the southern hemisphere you, hemisphere, you can argue that this experiment for some reason is sensitive, it's not seeing dark matter, but it's seeing some particular seasonal effect due to the fact that December in the northern hemisphere is winter and June is summer. So if we can reproduce in the southern hemisphere where the seasons are inverted and we see exactly the same pattern, we say we can nail it and say yes, indeed, we discovered dark matter. If for some reason we see the opposite pattern, we see maybe we discover a new seasonal effect on radioactivity, on low radioactivity or something we didn't think about. So it can be something interesting but not, dark, not as big as dark matter. Then the other thing is that, you remember, say, we really need to go very, very low radioactivity. You need to be able to be, build crystal, salt crystal, very, very pure, with no contamination of any kind of radioactivity, in particular potassium. Potassium, it's evil, really evil, <laughs> because it's really mimic the, the dark matter signal. And, and create crystal, very, very pure from radiation, from, uh, it's really, really difficult because a fractional amount of radiation is almost everywhere. For example, even in the water, if you drink the water and it's not uh, uh, from uh, the catchment here in uh, Melbourne, because it's, being, it's raining water, it's contaminated, well, contaminated, as a fraction of tritium that comes from the atmosphere. Or uh, if you want and you get deep underground water, it's contaminated with uh, uh, radon that then decay in, in uh, lead uh, um, to 10. And this is also very dangerous for this kind of experiment. And then you need similar condition exactly in the same laboratory in uh, Gran Sasso because otherwise you will not be able to reproduce it. So what is the advantage? So what is next? Well, 
That's what me and Jeremy were looking, a place in the southern hemisphere, a way of reproducing this crystal in very similar condition to the Grand Sasso lab. The first condition we solved when installed we, were, um, we start a partnership with uh, Stoll City Council and the New Market Gold, that is a gold mine, in which, with the help of also of Ansto, in uh, looking at this gold mine, that is a decline mine, still operational, and we wanted to use this mine, because a very ideal condition, the same condition of Gran Sasso, to do our experiment. And the council was very enthusiastic about this idea and it helped us a lot. And so together also with the mind that hosts that, they started this adventure and now they will be, next year, will be operational the first Southern Hemisphere Underground Lab. If you notice at the beginning when I show all the underground lab are in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the first underground lab in the Southern Hemisphere and will be situated in Victoria in the Stoll Gold Mine here, nearby the Grampians. As I say, similar condition to uh, Gran Sasso, in particular the same depth. This is Gran Sasso, this will be Stoll, so the amount of material in, on, the to on top of our experiment will be the same than Gran Sasso. And uh, we got support by the federal and uh, Victorian government. We got three and a half million, half from the state government of Victoria and half from uh, the federal state, from the regional development grants, this one, to build this underground lab. This is the first one. And you can see this is, is the mine. We will be one kilometer underground. This is when we go down. This is in the mine, because you can go down by car. And this will be the lab. Here will be the dark matter detector. Here will be the entrance of people. And because radioactivity must be kept a minimum, as you enter in the lab, here there will be shower. You will be obliged to shower, change, put clean clothing, and enter in the lab. <coughs> you will have also one uh, room here where will be uh, detector apparatus to measure radioactivity to a very, very tiny level. And here you can see, this is a picture of other lab, just to give an impression, there will be where we will arrive and park our car over here. So this is the design that we are going to build. We also analyze uh, that not only is ideal the situation because we are deep enough to be like Gran Sasso, this is the lab, this is the road, but also that the rock are very low radioactivity, and you can see again the banana, what we call a radioactivity, compare with the rock radioactivity and the, and the cement radioactivity, every, every kind of element that we bring down, we need to measure and be low radioactivity. For example, we are looking all over Victoria, all over Australia to find uh, for the concrete, for the shotcrete that we need for the lab, the lowest radioactive sand that we could find. And we, uh, we analyzed almost uh, every single uh, quarry in, uh, um, in Australia. So which is the situation now? Well, as I say, we've been funded by the federal and the Victorian government, and we got quite a bit of support by many institutions. And uh, we started the construction. Here is the construction. You can see here the drill that will go. It's a particular construction. The, big, uh, the tunnel will be bigger than the normal uh, mine tunnel. Not ma the normal mine tunnel is five meters by five. We will have 10 meters by 10 because the experiment must be, is the normally the experiment are big. And you can see here the, the beginning of the, the start of the, the, of the lab. Here you can see how we go down in the lab. This is physics at work. You see that I arrived there and I need to change gears. It's not the normal gear that you see a physicist with. And then we drive down in the mine. And then uh, when there will be the lab, we will need to change in clean clothing. At the moment, we don't have a lab, but we are taking measurement to understand the radioactivity around in the lab. And so we have our pod. This is where we are now. This is our portable uh, uh, exper um, lab. You can see is one of the refuge. And here we have some of our apparatus that we start doing some tests. So at the moment is that and then we'll be down. So you can see how physicists can uh, 
can be a little bit different in what they do. And so here there is a little bit of the timeline, just to give you an idea. In 2014, we proposed it. Here is where the, the picture that where they gave the, the beginning of this lab. Here there was the director of, this is the director, what is, what is, what is? Here is the director of the Grand Sasso lab that came and visit because we wanted to repeat this experiment. And they say, oh, I really doubt. They say, you know what you can do in this mine? Because we thought, you know, we put a portable pod and we put experiment there. And he said to us, you know what? I think this mine is good for having a small lab. Why not? The people, the, the stall council say, you know what? I think it's a good idea because this kind of lab are really quite Im important also for the community, not only for the physicists. For example, the Grand Sasso lab uh, bring just to the community there of Asergi, is a, is a village that is more or less the stall community, something like 8,000 visitors a year. So for, for regional Victoria, they find that it was very interesting. Apart that also they think that as it happened in all places where there are labs, there is a big retention of uh, of kids in school and people going to STEM uh, kind of um, my, um, study. So we started construction, as I say. There was uh, yesterday, uh, I was uh, overseas, but there was one of the ministers of Victoria going there because they had a signing of the old document to start construction. In 2017, uh, the the laboratory will be ready and we will start this experiment to test DAMA. In the meanwhile, having um, an underground lab in uh, Victoria, in the southern hemisphere, and being a hit. From all over the world, they're contacting us that they want to do something with this lab. We have interest from the US, the UK. We have uh, interest by, um, by the, the Spanish. Many, many people want to start collaboration with us and want to have idea to go do. Also, biologists are coming because it's very important. They want to do tests in very low radioactive um, environment, for example, for cell. We even had an inquiry and then some people coming to do experiment on silk, growing silk uh, underground. I don't know why, I don't ask. Or even for astrobiology, I don't know, it's like, there was uh, these people say, we would like to bring uh, the silk uh, back down there and see what's happened to silk. And then even with uh, astrobiology, because you would like to know if uh, you need water and light to beginning life or it can come underground and how it evolves. There's been a lot in this underground lab, a lot of also biology, how life evolves without radioactivity, with zero radioactivity. And there are very interesting results. We need natural radioactivity. So just to give you an idea of how popular it's been, this is a little bit of the kind of uh, media we went from the new scientist, and this is in the Sunday Age. This is one of the cover of the Sunday Age, Cosmos, and also we went many, many times in the Stell Town Hall to present what we were doing, where we are very popular there. We even have a jacket with the, um, with the lab logo, and we go around. So it's been, as I say, it's been a very, it's, a, it's not even started and already, a lot of people are going to stall, and stall now is known internationally. As I say, we have been contacted even by New York uh, um, um, journalists to give information about the lab. So now we have the lab, now what about the experiment? Well, with the experiment, we started this experiment called SABRE. Sodium iodide is a crystal as DAMA and uh, with an active background rejection. And this is what we want. It's an experiment that is very similar to DAMA. And uh, we want to repeat the looking for SABRE for this modulation that DAMA sees to nail it. And uh, we will have uh, this uh, detector installed in two places. There will be the Italian one and there will be the stall one. And if we see the same signal in Italy as they see installed, means we nail it. Means that we are going to discover dark matter or, let's say, not. 
So this is the same collaboration to build this detector. You can see that there is Princeton, it's led by the University of Princeton, and then there is the Bayern University in Italy and in America, but as you can see that now is the University of Melbourne, I knew Swinburne and Adelaide. There is a large, large component of Australians. This is maybe the first dark matter experiment Australian dominated and led. This is our ultra pure detectors. You can see that the potassium is really, really minor. In our body, there is much more, 10 times more, 100 times more potassium than in this crystal. Again, it will look like this big, big experiment I showed before. We will put water because obviously uh, we don't have Roman lead unless the Italians are so kind to give us some of the Roman lead. We will need to use water and we will have again a big, big, big tank in which inside we will put this sodium iodide crystal and we will try to see what we see with dark matter. The idea is that once this detector is installed, install, we will take three years, less than three years, to measure if DAMA, this experiment, is right. So in three years from, say, before 2020, we will know if the DAMA experiment discovered dark matter or indeed discover some other interesting phenomena that is not dark matter. And this is, will be the only experiment, the SABRE experiment, that can have three things. We are in the southern hemisphere, and so we can test. We manage to get the same purity on sodium iodide than DAMA. Nobody else in the world managed. There are many years they tried that didn't succeed, but the Princeton group succeeded in that and even exceeded. And then the third part is that we will have two experiments, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere, so we can check if we see the same things. And so this is the situation of the dark matter cap. So what is the situation? Well, over the last hundred years, we developed many theories, including the general relativity of Einstein. And this general relativity tells us that most probably we have dark matter in the universe. 85% of the matter in the universe is dark matter. But still we don't know what is the 85% of the matter of the universe. And the only way we can do is detecting, seeing that in this way, in direct detection. A very difficult experiment because you need to eliminate radioactivity, natural radioactivity that exists everywhere. And interesting enough, believe it or not, maybe that um, the search for dark matter may be a very successful uh, conclusion. So maybe we can catch it at the end. And uh, the key is right here in Victoria, installed nearby the Grampians. So we hope so. Cross finger. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think they are over there, over there. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you, dear, for the explanation. Uh, if uh, dark matter keep whole universe together and dark energy expand universe, how we don't know this stuff? What is it, dark energy or dark matter? We don't know what is dark matter. We don't know what is en dark energy. We know that it's there because we know only the interaction from gravity. But we don't know what it is. Does dark matter keep whole universe together? The dark matter keep the galaxy together. Not whole universe? No, the galaxy. What about dark energy, expand the universe? The dark energy is a much more complex thing. Most probably is embedded in the Einstein equation of general relativity, but we don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is. We know that there is these things, but we don't know what it is. Thank you. This is really dark, dark. Okay, so we assume that it's interacting through the weak force. 
that is the same force that fuel, for example, the fusion in the sun. There is, it's called the weak force, it's, uh, and that's why we call it weak. We don't know the cross-section. So we know that we started assuming that it was relatively larger than uh, one light year. And uh, as we don't see anything, we go down, 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 and uh, there is, we assuming that if it's weak, the force, it cannot be below a certain fraction, but we don't know. So we only know the maximum? We don't only know the maximum, yes. And that's why we have so many different apparatus. Starting in 2013, we had a meeting, uh, in a workshop, together with the astronomer. We, uh, the particle and the astronomer, and there was, uh, and I was assigned to talk about how you could find dark matter, and uh, I start studying and I say, well, maybe we can do something here in Australia. Yes, it can form lumps. In fact, if you look at the, uh, how they represent uh, dark matter in the galaxy, you can see lumps. Um, assuming the grand factor results actually are due to dark matter, what constraints does that put on the dark matter particles, like what mass, Low mass. can be two kinds of mass. I can be what we call 50 GV, medium mass or very low mass. Very, very light particle. Lighter than what people, well, theorists uh, think of. Will be a very interesting if the, this experiment is true. It will um, give a lot of um, food for thought because it will be something that is not really what the mainstream expect. What's that number again? 50 GeV. 50 GeV or less than 10 GeV. Oh. This is what we call it. We measure the mass in uh, in energy. is the amount of radioactivity that you have. There is always a little bit of radioactivity because naturally each element has an isotopes. And some of these isotopes so are elements that have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons are not stable, can be radioactive. As I say, potassium-40 is one per mil of the potassium in the world or in our body. And so in the, the lead, there will be also lead-210 that is radioactive. And lead-210 is a half-life, so it decays in many, many years. So if you have something that has been built, created, done 2,000 years ago and left under the sea, so uh, protected, it gets a very low radioactivity. Yeah, and in the contrary, if you keep uh, underwater, there is not irradiation at all. It's the same, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same. Anything that is in, in, a, in a mine, if you have e even um, anything, uh, yeah, even copper, the copper as soon as it can, you know, the copper in the mine is the most pure element that you can think about. But then you bring in the, uh, on the surface and get irradiated and get a little bit radioactivity. Dark matter do not create black holes because it's, because it doesn't interact to you know normal matter collapse in black hole because it interacts so it slows down. Dark matter is not incredibly fast but it's not incredibly slow because it doesn't interact, it doesn't slow down. Well, I guess I'm getting can the extra mass actually be a black hole in the center? They did yes, they did look at that and uh, there are study and observation and they, uh, they rule it out. Yes, but it's very difficult. There is even a theorist that assumed that you can take DNA strength 
and see if uh, dark matter can uh, che you know can uh, um, modify the DNA. So this could be this kind of experiment, but they're very very difficult because you really need to control everything. So it's much easier to eliminate than control. Look, they looked at many, many effects. All the fact that people could think they were thrown at them, and also this experiment is under Grand Sasso, where there are many other dark matter or neutrino experiments, and they look at correlation that could happen. For example, cosmic ray changes, the amount of cosmic ray that reach Earth changed with the season. And so it could be that some of the high, high, high energy cosmic ray can penetrate even down there, and this could be an effect. Unfortunately, all the other experiments don't, they measure this correlation, but it doesn't correspond to that. So it's, a, it's an interesting mystery. Could be, could be, but nobody pinned down. You can assume that, that you can really assume that those, this dark matter is still because it doesn't interact with anything. So it's just like you can think about still, still, and we move inside the dark matter. It moves, but all over the place, it is scattered. It doesn't have a, a precision, a precise direction because it moves around. It's like people that move around scattering, they all move in more or less in the same direction, but scatter around because they don't interact, so they cannot coagulate. Yes? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, so is dark matter falling into black holes or not? Or no. No, it cannot because it doesn't interact much. So it cannot coagulate. But it will always... Yeah, but it interacts gravity, so they keep together, but it doesn't keep as straight. Because the normal matter not only has gravity, as soon as you put two protons together or two neutrons together, they start forming atom, you know, nucleus and so on. So they interact and they keep together. So if you don't have this other kind of interaction, it's a little bit more free, and so they cannot create... A, they if, there, if there was a black hole there with ordinary matter, wouldn't some be attracted to it? Yes but you will not be able to distinguish. So put it this way, to, to create a black hole, you need to slow down matter. And there is no way you can slow down something that doesn't interact very much. One more question. So you think it's um, Well, it depends. There are different hypotheses or could be dark matter. If it's a, a scale, you know, a spin zero, yeah. It could be also a, a, a different spin. I think this is probably a good place to stop. There's uh, questions about dark matter can go on for absolutely ever because you don't know exactly what it is. Um, I think uh, this is one of the most exciting parts of science where uh, it's, it's really a, a, a brand new world. Uh, we have very little information except that it gravitates. And um, I think with uh, Elizabeth's work, working with this uh, very strong team internationally and putting this uh, very very unique and important facility done uh, underground here in Stall. We are right in the driving seat for these questions to be answered in the future. So let's thank Elizabeth very much. For <laughs>